Hi everyone. In this video, we'll see the top 10 mistakes to avoid when experimenting with 8051 microcontrollers. Now, these are not coming straight out of ChatGPT or anything, but these are coming out of my almost 15 years of experience when working with controllers. Now, I stumbled upon a lot of mistakes and this video is here to show you how you can avoid them as well. Uh, the reason why I stumbled across all these mistakes was when I started experimenting. I was mostly starting with a breadboard, the same IC as shown over here attached to the breadboard. Then I used to connect crystal, capacitors and everything else and then download program into it and try to experiment. So let's get started with this video and let's see how you can not make or why you should not make all those mistakes that I'm showing here. Let's begin. So let's get started. The first mistake and for most almost every designer, even if they are seasoned ones, experienced one, do make this mistake. And that is the reset circuit. 8051's reset is actually an active high reset. Means whenever it gets a VCC potential, the controller stays in reset mode. Now, if you have configured your circuit by mistake, I'm sure you have checked the schematic, but if you have done it like this, then what's happening is the VCC is continuously going to pin number nine, making it stay in the reset forever. Instead, the circuit should look like this. The capacitor is short when the power turns on. So the VCC is connected or going to the pin number nine and then the controller is reset. As soon as the capacitor charges fully, the connection from reset pin to VCC is broken. Now it's connected to ground via register and your controller is in the operation mode. Make sure to check this one in your next project. Mistake number two is checking your crystal for physical damage. Now when you are creating projects at home, every single thing may look good. On your board if you have hand soldered it if you have created the pcb yourself everything looks good the the connections are all well everything that i show in this video is all well but still if the circuit is not working then make sure you check the crystal for physical damage my experience has been while soldering and this is a short one but while soldering there used to be a long crystal as well while soldering it if you accidentally drop your particular <coughs> crystal then also the the crystal may get damaged and it doesn't produce the kind of clock we require if nothing is working and everything has been checked and the crystal doesn't look physically damaged from outside i would still say do make sure to replace it and see what happens this has helped me a lot in many many situations it will save countless hours for you Number three mistake. This is not something that an experienced designer will do, but most freshers might make this mistake. Port zero of 8051 cannot function independently. Port zero of 8051 cannot function independently. It has to be connected with a pull up resistor like this. You can read it in all the basics. I will not repeat them, but this is important. If you are using port zero directly, it will not work. It has to have a pull up resistor like this. Mistake number four, floating inputs against VCC. Many a times it may happen that you accidentally connect a switch like this against VCC. Now what happens in this situation is the port pins of 8051 are internally pulled high. Now because of the internal pull up resistor, the pin, the logic of the pin is always high. Now, because of this, what happens is if you press the switch, it's getting high. If you release the switch, it's still getting high. So make sure you connect an external pull down resistor as shown over here. If you are interfacing a switch, better yet, don't interface your switch against VCC and instead just connect it against ground. Mistake number five. Low logic input voltage. Many a times we are interfacing with things like sensors, minor sensors, smaller sensors. Um, uh, it may be a line following sensor, a proximity sensor, which is probably giving you a three volt logic high output. 8051, most 8051 ICs, I'm referring to ET series, do not understand that logic well. It can treat everything below four volt as logic zero. 
So if you are using 8051, make sure you interface devices which are having 5 volt as their logic high supply voltage. Mistake number six, the UART connection. Whenever you are interfacing 8051 with things like RFID reader, Bluetooth or GSA or Zigbee module, any such kind of devices which works on UART. Now in such cases, what happens is we might make a mistake to connect the TXT to TXT of the other device. It shouldn't be like that. If you are interfacing with a Bluetooth module, make sure you are connecting TXT of microcontroller to the RXT of UART and RXT of microcontroller to the TXT of UART. Simple mistake. Many of us will do it. Make sure you don't do that. And most importantly, this also applies to the USB to serial interface that we use, USB to UART. They also work in the same way. Again, this is not a common mistake that everyone will do, but you might still do. And that is pin number 31 must be connected to VCC. If it is not, the 8051 controller and your project will not work. This is important. I will not go into all the technical reasons, but it has to be made logic high. Keep it in your mind. Mistake number eight. Make sure the ground of interfacing circuits are made common with 8051. If you are interfacing with motor driver like L293IC, L298IC, they are powered from um, another 12 volt power supply or something like that. Make sure ground of that power supply is made common or connected with the ground of 8051. Without that, the interfacing circuit will not understand the logic given by 8051 or 8051 will not understand the logic signals given by the, those interfacing circuits. And it applies to your uh, UART operated devices as well, like Bluetooth, Zigbee, RFID reader and those kind of things. Mistake number nine, a clean power supply. And I know you have heard it hundreds, thousands, I don't know how many times, but this is very, very important. These are some of the tips that you can use to make sure your power supply is clean. But in my experimentation, when I used to make, let's say, around five to 10 different projects per month, the most common one was I used to use an, an SMPS, a nine volt SMPS or 12 volt SMPS uh, to power on the circuit. Yes, there is a 7805 regulator or something like that. But I used to avoid using transformer and bridge rectifiers. And that is a big mistake. Making use of transformer is the simplest way to ensure you have a clean power supply. And if you must use an SMPS adapter, you have to make sure the quality is good because there are so many cheap alternatives. They just will be written as 2 ampere supply, 3 ampere supply and an actual, they won't be even able to deliver 500 milliamps. But when you use a transformer, make sure your supply voltage and the supply lines remains stable. To do that, what you can do is you can simply use a 10 microfarad capacitor across the voltage lines close to 8051. Best option is to use a switching regulator like LM2575 or LM1117, which is an LDO. And check the power supply consumption. It will always happen that if you are using motor drivers, they are getting less current than 8051 should have. And the issue is it resets. You have written your robot to go straight for 10 seconds and turn right for 5 seconds. It goes straight and it just keeps going straight because when the motors turn on, because of the power supply is down, it pulls the whole 5 volt line down and the 8051 is reset. So it just keeps going forward on and on and on. And it happens with everyone. So make sure to do that. Last, most important one, but the simplest one to see by your naked eyes is if you're hand soldering or hand making your PCBs, make sure all the tracks are well connected to each other. And even if they look correct, many a times the solder dot may be dried out. It's not well connected. And the very non-noticeable thing is the solder dot is there, the track is going there, but exactly at the juncture where the solder dot connects the track, the track might be wrong or the drill hole, if it is manually drilled PCB, is damaging the track. So just use multimeter and check connectivity across the non-working connections and simply apply a jumper if there is any broken connection. I hope this will help you in your experimentation. Please do let me know if this video helps and see you. Thank you.